Welcome to our summit, National Doctors' Day, a tribute to the torch bearers of health. I'm Nutan Manohar, an adjunct faculty of the Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata, for well-being, and the founder of Me Met Me. Medications play a crucial role in treating diseases, yet it is the doctors who have the power to heal patients. They serve as steadfast pillars of a nation's healthcare system, often selflessly prioritizing the well-being of others above their own. In India, we commemorate National Doctors' Day on the 1st of July in honor of the visionary physician Dr. Bidan Chandra Roy on his birth anniversary. Today on this occasion, timesofindia.com is hosting a digital conclave uniting doctors from very specialties and policy makers to acknowledge and celebrate these courageous healthcare warriors while addressing the obstacles they face. Let us embark on this journey of celebrating doctors. And when it comes to today's sessions, we will be looking into the breakthroughs in healthcare research and they have undeniably proven to be a significant boon for both doctors and patients alike. For this reason, we have with us Dr. Dipyaman Ganguly. Dr. Dipyaman Ganguly is a physician scientist who, had, who does research in human immunology and currently is the principal scientist in Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata. He did his PhD and MD from he did his PhD from MD Anderson Cancer Center, USA, and did his postdoctoral research in Columbia University, USA. Before joining IICB in 2013. He has two U.S. patents and a long list of internationally acclaimed publications and is a recipient of the National Bioscience Award from the Department of Biotechnology, India. We also have with us Dr. Anurag Agarwal. He's a professor. Uh, he's the former director of the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, a national laboratory of CSI, CSIR, India. His primary research is in respiratory biology and broader in interests are in new vision of health and healthcare, healthcare seen through the lenses of emerging technologies. He serves on numerous national and global advisory groups, recently chairing the World Health Organization's Technical Advisory Group for SARS, COV2, Viral Evolution, the Lancet Financial Times Commission for Governing Digital Health Futures, and serving on the Pandemic Preparedness Subgroup at the Global Partner Partnership for Artificial Intelligence. He received the Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize in 2014, the Sun Pharma Foundation Award in 2020, and is a fellow of the Indian National Science and Medical Academics. Thank you, doctor, for being with us. Dr. Raman Ganga Khedkar is he's the former head division epidemiology and communicable diseases, Indian Council of Medical Research, New Delhi, and the director in charge, National AIDS Research Institute, Pune. He's a member of the National Task Force on COVID-19 and also a member of the Clinical Research Group and Epidemiology and Operational Research Group for the National Task, Re National Task Force on COVID-19. He is a member of WHO's Scientific Advisory for the Origin of Novel Pathogens. He is a member of the governing body of the National Institute of Tuberculosis Respiratory Diseases, New Delhi, and the National Health Systems Resources Center, New Delhi. He's a member, Empowered Committee, Central Institute, Central Institute Body of the new AIIMS, constituted by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Also member of the High-Level Inter Interministerial Steering Committee for EcoHealth Initiatives in India constituted by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. He is also the member of many more committees, boards and groups. He is a recipient of the Padma Sri 2020, Doctor of Med Medical Sciences, Honours Koswa by the Datta Meghe Institute of Medical Sciences in 2021 and awarded DLIT by Symbiosis International in 2022 with many other awards to his name. And finally, we have Dr. Harsh Mahajan. He is the founder and managing director of the Mahajan Imaging and Labs, New Delhi. He runs a chain of high-end centers of excellence in integrated diagnostics, including radiology, imaging, nuclear medicine, lab medicine, pathology, and genomics. He's also the chairman of the Department of Nuclear Medicine and PEPET CT and Sergeant. He's also the chairman of Department of Nuclear Medicine and PETCT at Sir Gangaram Hospital. He graduated from Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi in 1982 and post-graduation in radio diagnosis from the prestigious PGI-MER Chandigarh. 
after which he was awarded a Rotary Foundation Fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Hospital and Research Institute in Houston. In the year 1998, he was appointed as the Honorary Radiologist to the President of India and he continues to hold the post till date. He was awarded one of the highest civilian national honours of Padma Shri in 2002. He's the president of Indian Radiology and Imaging Association and is also the consultant of International Atomic Energy Association. Dr. Dipyaman, how much do we know about why do some people fall ill with infections while others do not? So if you could help us understand a bit more about immunology and what is it that we know that is comparatively new to the particular topic? Right. So this has been a great enigma for most of the times we have been dealing with patients, right? It's just not a recent um, realization. But what recently has happened is during the pandemic, uh, it was at our face because a whole lot of infections were happening all around us. And we could figure out, yes, not all people were actually responding to the infections or getting infected in the same manner. And uh, so naturally there was a scare, generalized scare of who will succumb to the severe disease and unfortunate outcomes of the disease in case of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And naturally a whole lot of effort has been put into this question over the last two, three years. And now uh, perhaps we know a uh, little bit of immunological aspects that may have uh, happened in certain patients in some ways and uh, that's why they were succumbing to the infection because you have to remember perhaps all of us have uh, learned from even news portals that uh, in during this viral infection as with other viral infections also uh, the severity of disease largely comes from uh, hyperactivity of our immune system and it seems some of the individuals uh, who are getting the infection, they have they are more prone to get hyperactivation of immune system. Now, why are they prone to those hyperactivations? Now, we think that there are um, influences of their like pre-existing comorbidities or diseases, like diabetic patients. They seem to have uh, larger uh, chances of getting. Uh, this hyperactivation of immune response and uh, so by that time the viral infection has perhaps um, subsided but still the severity of the disease continues. So I think this has been a great pointer during this recent pandemic that this is something uh, that we should be uh, like should pay heed to and we do more research a whole lot amount, I mean, whole amount of research has been gone into it. We know certain pointers on what we have to look at. Uh, and I believe within a half a decade, we'll know more about it. I mean, why certain people are uh, getting like more severe diseases. Uh, but as I said, so from the initial pointers, it seems um, a healthy lifestyle when there is no pandemic will actually um, make you uh, like i mean make the chances of getting severe disease during a viral infection less it may be surprising to know but it seems that's the way it is and uh, so metabolic derangements that is present in your um, day-to-day -day lifestyle and uh, which is caused by day-to-day -day lifestyle may actually make you more prone to these severities thank you dr dipuman so health begins from making healthy choices uh, primarily. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Anurag Agarwal, how is gene sequencing helping doctors with diagnosis? Great point, Muthun. Basically, I think we can look at two extremes of life. We can look at early age diseases. We can also look at later age disease like cancer. And we can look at infectious diseases. In each of these, you can realize that the ability of sequencing and now it is integrated into what Dr. Mahajan will speak later, integrated diagnostics labs that he has opened for five years. So once when a baby was born and was not developing properly, and they had a rare disease that could be genetic in origin, people used to spend years trying to figure out the diagnosis. Today, by a combination of sequencing either specific genes, if you have a very good idea of what the 
the disease might be with the entire genome if nobody has seen quite that type of a disease before you can get the answer very fast and this is not just for diagnosis it also translates to therapy there is a wonderful case a few years ago of a young girl in whom nobody had any idea what the problem they had by sequencing they could identify a particular mutation that led to what is called in genes an exon a part that is you know translated into a protein was getting skipped they could design an anti sense oligonucleotide which basically means something that counters that defect customized to that one patient and had complete effect in curing the disease today you know that you know women who have breast cancer um they can find out their own risk by using genes called braca and not only can they use it for themselves to figure out what they want to do they can also do it for other uh, members of the family doctors not everybody has to live in fear their entire life that i might have inherited my mother's problem also in this case treatment change so many cancers will respond to some treatments not to others some mutations can lead to cancer that just melt away the minute you give a drug called tyrosine kinase inhibitors there's a class of drugs not the name of anyone and these people when you sequence them you can decide a type of therapy that will completely lead to remission so i think we are seeing wonderful applications in human treatments and also during the pandemic you saw lots of applications of sequencing in pandemic surveillance we could see how the virus changed we could estimate even before we had more data what properties would change whether immune escape would get better whether vaccines would reduce their effectiveness in preventing infections so i think whatever the sphere of medicine that you see genomics is becoming an integral part and not only for standard diseases for new uses that we are yet to even imagine today i'll stop here for now thank you dr anurag uh, dr raman if you could shed some light on the uh, discovery of anti hiv drugs and how has it re- helped reduce the spread of hiv and especially worked on enhancing the quality of life and lifespan of people living with hiv if you actually look at the last pandemic no the one that came before uh, before covid no because other pa- and the other so called pandemics never really became pandemics like SARS or uh, MERS, they never never became pandemics per se. But if you look at it, it was HIV, which was HIV disease as we call, or AIDS as we say in uh, layman's language. So that was discovered in eighty one. The way it was spreading you know, was too dramatic, you know? and then people were scrambling because it was. It, it, once you are diagnosed with AIDS, people used to die. You know, they used to develop, get some kind of opportunistic infections as the disease progressed. And within seven years span, you know, after becoming uh, infected, majority of them would succumb. You know, more than fifty percent would succumb to uh, this particular infection. now um, that was a big challenge to find out what could be the treatment that we can provide to them in 1987 no they were looking at different drugs no and they have the drug libraries and they found one of the drugs called as zirovudin which was actually tested before as a drug against malignancy and they found it to be useless at that time this drug was found to be useful in one of the trials that was done it was a monotherapy which means only one drug was given in 87 the trial was stopped because the evidence was strong enough that it helps people with aids actually survive longer and then the sequence followed no we had monotherapy then sequential regimen as new drugs started getting discovered and then we went for triple drug therapy three drugs to be used in as antiretroviral drugs as protease inhibitors one of the classes of drugs was discovered in 1994 and found to be extremely useful what is the implication if you if i recall no, my past 
because I come from HIV background. In 1990, WHO had said that by 2000 AD, India would have close to 4 crore people who will be infected by HIV. Now, that was very tough. But once these drugs came, they ensured that not only these drugs enhanced the quality of life by reducing the morbidity that could occur to them with respect to opportunistic infections, it also ensured that they survive as long as any other individual. He may or may not be, he may even not be infected by HIV. But today we claim that because these people tend to seek advice from doctors repeatedly because of their infection and regularly, perhaps they may survive longer than even HIV negative individuals. That difference has been made by antiretroviral therapy. Now this we call as antiretroviral therapy. Now this antiretroviral therapy, when people used it, they found that if you provide this to any infected individual, the risk of transmission also goes down because it reduces the viral load to a significant degree. And the result is we have now a new concept which is called as U is equal to U. Undetectable is equal to untransmissible. And you can today you can actually see the evidence. Now, when we started using antiretroviral therapy, the result today that you are seeing is currently there are only 23 lakh people who are estimated to be infected by HIV. Now, who can give this treatment? Any person can give the treatment. These are oral drugs that can be provided very easily. Earlier, these drugs used to call 40,000 rupees per month. And this is a treatment that you have to take lifelong. Today, with generic pharma, actually bringing down the prices, it has come down to less than 1000 rupees per month. So this is easily feasible. People can take it very easily. It has impacted healthcare practice so strongly that any person who understands little bit of HIV and if he encounters the HIV infected individual, every physician can think in terms of providing the treatment to them and ensure that these people will not die due to AIDS. Over. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Uh, Dr. Harsh, apart from being a busy practicing radiologist, you've also been very active in the field of research over several decades. What changes do you uh, are you seeing in research scenario? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, I think there's been uh, a dramatic change in the way uh, research both in the public as well as the private sector uh, is being looked at. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, Anurag there who's uh, in a private uh, research uh, uh, group and uh, Dr. Ganga Ketkar and Dr. Ganguly who are in the public sector. And uh, I, for one, I practice radiology and also, you know, we dabble in uh, whatever we can. Uh, I think the mindset has changed. Uh, the there is overlap, which is there in in the mindset that someone who's practicing uh, and someone who's a researcher have to be different people. I think that is undergoing uh, a change in this country, and especially ever since the pandemic, we've seen that there's been uh, a lot of synergy that has come in. Uh, uh, on my part, I would say that uh, uh, I started uh, as a radiologist over three decades ago. And in the beginning, it used to be only clinical research that, you know, you have patients coming, they get diagnosed or they get treated and you collect the data and you publish it. That actually uh, uh, was what was research for most uh, in, in medical colleges. And you had uh, the ICMRs and the CSIRs uh, uh, where, you know, pure research and also applied research would actually happen. I think with the changing policies, apart from changing mindset, 
now there is funding that's available not only for the private sector but the government also funds you know the private sector and that's where you have these small two three five person startups which have done tremendous work and and we saw that happen during the pandemic be it uh, uh, for uh, making these uh, rt pcr kits uh, also doing some work uh, towards the vaccine where you know the the bulk of the work initially was done in government institutes and then it's the private sector who took that on and brought out those uh, vaccines similarly in the field of artificial intelligence having said that i would say that still a lot needs to be done we are on the right path but this uh, uh, working in silos is beginning to actually change i'm uh, on uh, you know a uh, committee of the government uh, m- you know advising for uh, a make in india mri and hopefully by the end of this month we will have a indigenous superconducting uh, mri with a magnet that is also made in india india would become the sixth country in the world to actually start uh, manufacturing magnets here we have other areas where now the public and the private work together what we need to also see is a, a, a mechanism by which ultimately this research the development that has happened comes into clinical use and that's where i think more work needs to be done not only do the academia uh, need to get involved but also industry so that we can have a vibrant group where the researcher actually build something starting with uh, the need that's the most important change that i've seen that researchers today are trying to solve a problem that exists and not just making something and then trying to find a problem which that uh, invention would solve and and so i i think uh, there there's a lot uh, uh, that is changing uh, a lot that needs to still change but we are on the right path over to you thank you dr harsh that sounds like we are living in exciting times not just an indigenous mri may we continue to make many more diagnostic tools as well as therapies that are indigenous thank you so much dr harsh uh, dr dipyaman in our recent memory it is completely filled with the pandemic how do you think the progress in vaccine research is going to help in future pandemics right i think uh, one of the major um gains from this experience of pandemic has been uh, development of platform technologies i mean the by the word platform technology means now you have technologies that can be uh, reusable that can be made reusable for newer uh, infectious agents newer pandemics and uh, so two things came together one is the genomic sequencing technology that dr anurag was talking about so within um, one month of who declaring that we are actually going to face a pandemic we had the genome sequence of the pathogen in hand and that was because of the genomic sequencing uh, technologies that are available and the improvement the achievement that has been made in that domain now because we already uh, had this sequence of the new pathogen that are knocking our doors uh, we also could develop mrna vaccines very fast so the last vaccine which was so late 1960s we had mumps vaccine and that was um, known to be the fastest developed vaccine and that also took 4 years in this case because of i would say because of ngs or next generation sequencing technology and the genomic sequencing it could be developed within almost 6 months well maybe we got a little bit later but it was developed by 6 months and that's phenomenal more importantly these were platforms so now you if you have a new pathogen you have platforms to know the sequence fast and then incorporate into into uh, existing vaccine development uh, platform and 
churn out new vaccines that's phenomenal i think that has been phenomenal uh, development in this field and um, we have mrna vaccine platforms we have newer subunit vaccine platforms where you take a protein from the uh, virus and put it in and um, I was so elated to hear about this indigenous MRI. I would also uh, like to say that we are now having mRNA vaccine platform technologies available in India. So there are several groups working towards more important. In India, there has been this uh, uh, idea that all only public funds will go into it. No, for this new mRNA platform technology, there are private funds being uh, put in so that this platform is available to Indians. There is There are philanthropic funds, philanthropic funding agencies and philanthropic funds being put in into the same effort. So that's a great change in the country, you know. So government along with the private players, along with the philanthropic efforts, all are realizing that these are things that will make our nation stronger. These are going to make us more uh, prepared for future pandemics or future uh, infections. And we have this uh, platform technologies available for churning out vaccines fast enough. Well, in when you are making a new vaccine, there are always um, chances of failure when it is rolled out into the wild, you know, when you are giving it to the human beings. Because you have to remember, vaccines are tried on healthy human beings. And naturally, it's not like an anti-cancer drug. It's a healthy human individual is going to get the first vaccine dose. And so you have to make it sure that you, are, you have plugged all the loopholes. And in that respect also, in that regulatory respect also, I think we have come a long way and perhaps the pandemic allowed us to do that. And uh, due to the pandemic, now our regulatory approval stages have been much more streamlined. You, you saw several four to five vaccines being rolled out with proper regulatory loopholes being plugged uh, and given to human, uh, I mean, tried in humans, right? And that experience will also, this, is, this may be a policy experience, but again, this will also help us a lot in terms of developing new vaccines and offering them to the uh, population when new need arises. So I would rather uh, point out to these two things. So genomic sequence going to platform technologies and phenomenal policy regularizations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deepuman. You have reassured us that the next vaccine, if a pandemic does arise, is going to have much less turnaround time. So thank you so much, Dr. Deepuman. Uh, Dr. Anurag, we were speaking about genomic sequencing. Can regular doctors be trained to handle genomic information or would it require specialization? Great point, because as you can imagine, genomic sequence results will become commonly available as we go forward, which means there can be only one future in which the average physician is equipped to handle this. But obviously that's not true today. So what would be the changes we would need to get to the point where regular physicians who have not been extensively trained as genetic researchers become well equipped to deal with the results coming out of genetic sequencing. And I would say this can be thought of in three different ways. There will be specialist cater within physicians who might extend their expertise all the way down into choosing what type of sequencing to order, how to do that sequencing, how to do quality control of that sequencing and generate results. And these doctors may not necessarily even be medical doctors, PhDs may be the main workforce of this particular area. And we need to also bridge that gap where, you know, PhDs and MDs work together in doing things side by side. The second part, once you've got quality controlled sequencing data coming to a clinician, how does a clinician begin to use it? And in that, we have already made substantial progress in terms of auto interpreters. So which means for a variety of mutations, there are already programs that can scan, generate reports. And this is not yet in the domain of true AI. I'm simply speaking of where there is a strong evidence base they can flag mutations of likely concern. They can generate scores 
and it almost will end up reading like a pathology report that every doctor reads today. The next level, which I think is going to come, but is not there yet, is when we are using things like artificial intelligence to make predictions for mutations for which we do not yet know what the exact meaning is. And we must remember in India that is important. Most of the sequencing databases in the world are from the West. When in the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, my former institute, we sequenced a thousand genomes, we found 15 million new variations not previously in the databases. That is simply because Indians are so genetically diverse and have never been sequenced. Similarly, even for well-known diseases, when we sequence Indian patients, we find mutations that have not been found before. But we cannot wait for all these mutations to be found. So we have to use artificial intelligence to make predictions from the mutations it sees and give a sense of what is likely to be causing disease. And that's going to be a great area in the future already with things like alpha fold. We can now predict protein structures from mutations and many other things that are happening. And recently with what is called large language models, chat GPT being an example, GPT-4 is not chat by the way, they can take multimodal data and they can almost get to the point where they can do tasks they were not explicitly given a database for. And while they tend to hallucinate and go wrong right now, there is plenty of scope for improvement in data and architectures that will make this a reality. So I look forward to the time when an average doctor is as comfortable with the genomic data report as they are with the pathology report. Thank you, Dr. Rag. Let's look forward to that time. Dr. Raman, you had mentioned about drugs that were tested and found unsuccessful and later was found to be successful for HIV. What about HIV drugs and their connection to hepatitis B and C diseases? So could you help us understand if HIV drugs were found useful for hepatitis B and C? Yeah. One thing we must realize that hepatitis, whether B or C, was commonly found among those who were HIV infected and perhaps the reason why they were getting that infection was because of injection drug use, which was also one of the modes of transmission. So the entire focus in drug discovery suddenly started shifting to applications for managing other uh, infectious diseases that, that are associated with HIV. So initially, now, if you look at hepatitis B, it is also a chronic persistent infection, viral infection that you can see. Now, both these hepatitis viruses are known to cause cirrhosis and then finally, you know, they may result into hepatocellular carcinoma and the person would face a major issue in their life. Now, to begin with, um, hepatitis B, which was more commonly encountered because of injection drug use and even unsafe injections which used to cause this infection it was found that we were using only interferons, rivavirin as the drugs to manage this infection however since that, it, that, that infection used to be common among HIV infected people who were also getting drugs, uh, antiretroviral drugs it was found that lamivudine and uh, tenofovir were extremely powerful drugs and they ensured that the virus will not again, will be best suppressed and will not relapse. So this part of understanding led to an impetus to find new and newer drugs, not only against hepatitis B, but since in HIV we were using drugs against protease enzyme, similar approach was also tried in hepatitis C, which is more fatal infection, um, which had a very high morbidity per se. And today, at this time point, the entire movement has become so strong that whether it is hepatitis B, the fear we can actually suppress hepatitis B, and also ensure that it doesn't get transmitted from mother to the child. You look at hepatitis C. Hepatitis C, if I provide two oral drugs, depending on whether it is a complicated 
for uncomplicated hepatitis C infection i can ensure that the person is almost cured you no know, he would have viral load that would be suppressed the risk of development of hepatitis uh, hepatocellular carcinoma as well as cirrhosis can drop down dramatically and what is most important is these drugs can be given orally and today the cost of management by because of generic pharma has come down dramatically to a tune that it comes between couple of or probably around 10000 rupees you will still be able to manage to manage such a patient who otherwise you used to die so this this has impacted even the practice very strongly against hepatitis b hepatitis c and all that movement towards those drug discoveries actually emerged from hiv over thank you dr raman dr harsh what is the current status of the de- deployment of ai in radiology and how do you see as a future of this technology uh that's a very important question and uh, this is uh, something we've been grappling with for the last over 6 years see uh, radiology and imaging was the natural first area apart from maybe ophthalmology and to an extent dermatology where the data was digital from nearly two and a half decades so once you have digital data which is available all our images be they x rays ultrasound ct mri pet ct <coughs> they are all digital and because of availability of this digital data and also because this was getting stored we had a lot of data available and it's in radiology that uh, ai in healthcare actually uh, uh, started in a major way and has also started making a impact uh, chest x ray are being uh, read using ai head ct scans uh, head mris uh, for stroke uh, uh, chest nodule detection cancer in the chest all of these are areas where uh, uh, radiology in radiology ai is playing a role in fact as we speak there are nearly 300 plus ai algorithms that are us fda approved for use in day to day clinical practice even though there are so many that are available however if we look globally there are very few that are in clinical use and that is because deploying these uh, uh, ai algorithms has been a challenge each developer be it a young startup or a large company like a google or a ibm or academic institutions like our own iits or harvard or stanford and similar academic institutions they are only making few niche applications whereas for use in day to day clinical practice i do believe that we will need at least 150 to 200 applications so one small uh, uh, you know a developer trying to chain ch- chase the entire ecosystem for deployment is very very difficult and that's where over the last few years there have been certain uh, uh, you know startups which have uh, touted the platform approach to deployment of ai and uh, one of our startups which is called carpal.ai has also been working in that direction for the last 5 years in fact probably they were the first to suggest this approach way back in 2018 now here what happens on one platform you can host multiple ai algorithms Uh, it's it's more like a marketplace you know in our phones we have so many applications we use what we use the others are there and we pay only when we use them this was the approach uh, for uh, more rapid deployment of ai that has been thought of the other problem with anything is the trust that a healthcare system or a doctor 
has in a ai application and for that validation was very very necessary but uh, we've seen during the pandemic you know uh, there were uh, researchers saying that our ai application <coughs> for detecting uh, covid is 99% accurate but when it came into daily practice that wasn't the case so there what has been given is the concept of pre deployment testing it, you know unless a ai uh, has been developed on very heterogeneous data <coughs> it can go wrong in one hospital one ai algorithm may work very well it may not work very well in another uh, you know hospital just across the road and that's where you know these challenges are being faced for deployment of ai but having said that who has already you know approved three uh, ai uh, applications for detecting tuberculosis in chest x rays and and here they say that you can just go ahead and use them and it's only where they pick up a tuberculosis uh, uh, infection in the lung will a human being need to look at them the other more than 99.9% of normals may not even be looked at so as far as the future goes i think the future for ai deployment in healthcare as a whole and specifically in radiology and imaging in particular is very very bright this is going to help radiologists mark out abnormalities be able to do some tasks like measurement of uh, sizes of volumes help them do that much quicker and basically what i feel is that it has the potential of making an average radiologist good making a good radiologist excellent and at the same time with improvement of accuracy they will also be able to improve productivity today if a radiologist is able to re read 25 mri scans we hope that the same radiologist assisted by ai will be able to read 100 in the same time and do a better job of it also in the underserved parts of the world where radiologists are there is a shortage of radiologists ai will be able to fill the gap and be able to help clinicians help the physicians the surgeons the neurologists make their own decisions after reading the scan and so in the ultimate analysis it is going to be deployed on a very large scale in the coming 3 to 5 years it will serve areas where there is high tech there is availability of good radiologists making them better and in the underserved parts of the world work as a surrogate radiologist to provide reports and in the ultimate analysis reduce healthcare costs by in improving productivity thank you dr harsh looking forward to surrogate radiologists as you put it thank you so much for that i'm taking a bit of a pause here we have around two questions per speaker now and we have limited time so i would request that you kind of you know uh, keep the answer slightly more crisp so that we can you know wind up on time i'm fine to spend more time you know what's it discussing with you because this is really really inspir inspiring for me but yes we have a paucity of time so we have two questions per doctor coming up uh, we will try to main keep a shorter answer all right thank you so much starting off in 3 2 1 dr dipyaman what is in your opinion among the most recent scientific breakthroughs carry most hope for cancer patients well so that's something exciting that has happened from human immunology front where uh, we have been working so in our um, traditional ideas cancer 
uh, management has largely involved radiotherapies and chemotherapies. You know uh, the great pain that also is inflicted by those therapies and well they have been moderately successful in helping patients uh, if uh, they were they could be done early enough uh, after cancer diagnosis but recently now we have realized that our own immune system can actually help us in uh, handling the cancer and perhaps you all of us know that there was a nobel prize given for developing immunotherapies and so there are several forms of it. There are monoclonal antibodies which are uh, making our immune system react faster against the cancer and react more uh, vigorously. And there are cellular therapies coming up. So I think that these immunotherapies where you are uh, making your own immune system, I mean, the, making the patient's immune system uh, more trained and more active in response to the cancer, uh, will hold the future for cancer therapies and there are good uh, things in uh, store for immunotherapies in the future. I'll be just brief. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Tithyamu. Uh, Dr. Anurag, apart from genomics, how will AI change the practice of medicine? You know, this question had come last year around the same time. I would have said that AI would primarily only be used as tools. For example, we got wonderful example from Dr. Harsh Mahajan of how AI helps radiologists. But with the advent of the publicly available version of GP, ChatGPT 3.5 and the not yet publicly available version of GPT-4, which is being used and was recently published in a book of the, you know, by the Zach Cohan, we can see that given more reliable foundational models of AI, which will also include large language models, but will have a true foundation rooted in some real, real data. We are at a point when AI will be transforming healthcare at the point of interacting with patients, not being autonomous, but helping physicians find the answers to tough questions. Uh, just maybe a few days ago, they published a paper taking clinical pathology conferences from the New England Journal of Medicine, which is kind of the Bible Journal of Medicine. The well, Lancet will hate me for saying that. Uh, but basically, they took all cases after 2021. And these could not have been seen during the training of GPT-4, which was completed by 2021. And they found that in half the cases, the very difficult diagnosis was in the differential of GPT-4. And in 29% of the cases, it pretty much gave the diagnosis flat out. That's better than what I can do. It is far better than what most doctors I know can do. But when it goes wrong, it can go completely wrong. So we still need it to be used under supervision, but it can be a great adjunct to doctors for any difficult case and they're trying to solve. And this will get better and better. I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Anurag. Dr. Raman, premature aging is common among HIV-infected individuals. Is there any new development in the arena of anti-aging medicine? Absolutely. You know, we used to say that all those who are HIV-infected, when we manage them for other chronic morbidities that may evolve, we should add 10 years to their actual chronologic age and try thinking what would happen to them. So, when the treatment research you know, matured strongly, those people who were working in the field of HIV suddenly started thinking, how should I stop premature aging? One of the things that happened was during these studies, a you know, lot of basic research followed and what they essentially did was try and look at a newer kind of approach where every organ's aging and why does it age, how does it age was critically looked at. The result, there are two things that have emerged. One of the commonly used anti-diabetic drug, which we call as metformin. Now, this particular drug has been found to be extremely useful to reduce the speed at which we by and large age. Today we are at the first where we say that for these patients, we will also, in addition to ART, antiretroviral therapy, 
we would also provide metformin and those trials are continuing at this time point the second thing that has happened is you know there are people who develop you no know, uh, let's say somebody meets with an accident and there are certain issues that come up with cognition one of the drugs that has been tried now is which is called as maraviroc these are all names which are actual ph- pharmacologic names of these compounds maraviroc was one of the drugs which works against ccr uh, ccr5 receptor the result is they found that the losses in memory can be reduced if we use maraviroc so there are definitive movements that are occurring in the field of uh, aging premature aging and we hope we will be we will be able to not only understand this phenomena well but we will be able to reduce the speed thank you dr raman dr harsh with that we come to a conclusion of the breakthroughs in healthcare research and how they have proven to be a boon for both doctors and patients <music>